So I'd like to start by thanking the organizers and congratulations to Paul. And um, it might look like I'm talking to you about semi-empirical methods, and I am, but I'm also, it's also a little love song to couple cluster theory. So I thought this, this would be appropriate uh, for this conference. So from a, from a user point of view, uh, the, the ability to do couple cluster, or at least estimate, a uh, couple cluster energies with a complete basis at the complete basis set limit has really brought some exciting things to, to quantum biochemistry. Um, so it's true that, that these things are still, I know people are working on this, but I would argue still these methods are too, they're a little too expensive for this. Okay, but now we can, we can finally do this. So we can, we can do things, we can do, we can calculate molecular systems at this level of theory for things that are relevant to, to biology or to biochemistry, right? So for example, the, the hydrogen bond strength in a, in a base pair, okay? And it's really important that it's, that it's both converged with respect to the basis set and with respect to the correlation. And it is at least for the, uh, certainly for at least for these kinds of, of chemistries. So that is um, from a sort of an outsider point of view, that's what's, that's a, that's a big change, because that means that you now have another and alternate source of data if you want to parameterize faster methods. Uh, so before semi-empirical methods, the empiricism came from experiment, uh, and that has all sorts of problems associated with it. Uh, the most serious one is that very often you can't get the experimental data you need. So there's, there are holes in your in your chemical space, and that leads to holes in your parameter space, okay, simply because you cannot do the experiments. Uh, the other thing is that very often we fit the, the electronic energy of these semi-empirical methods, right, but the experimental data has all sorts of other messy stuff like vibrations and enthalpy effects and, and very often solvent effects and things like that, okay. So the fact that we can, we can now calculate things that we can trust uh, coupled cluster with uh, complete base set limit means that we have this, we have these databases now where we can go to that are, that are much more complete in terms of chemical space, right, and consistent from one molecule to the next. And so you can use that to parameterize semi-empirical methods. And as I'll try to argue here, that's a huge conceptual but, uh, advance, but also a huge practical advance, okay, because it leads to uh, better quantum mechanics that has semi-empirical methods that have fewer parameters and wider applicability, as I'll show you, okay? And when I say semi-empirical methods, right, I also include DFT in this. Uh, it, is, it is adjusted, right? So for example, the dispersion correcting, corrections for DFT has made an enormous difference in, in biomolecular modeling, right? And you're also now starting to get um, semi-empirical methods that are qualitatively different. So for example, coming from a, uh, uh, an enzymatic uh, enzyme mechanism point of view, going from, from AM1 to PM3 and now to PM6 has made an enormous difference, right? AM1 and PM3 gets the mechanism wrong, right? Completely wrong, so qualitatively wrong, and PM6 gets the mechanism right. We can argue about the barrier heights and so forth, right? But at least you're drawing the, the right structures along the reaction path, and that's a big deal, right? And when you now start to correct this, uh, with, with dispersion and also hydrogen bonding corrections, again, fitted to cover cluster data, right? You get some amazingly accurate methods. Uh, and so I highlight this one, this Hartree Fock 3C, which Stefan Grimmer has, has developed, right? Which is a, a minimal basis set method uh, with three kinds of corrections. Okay, so it starts from minimal basis set and has some corrections for dispersion and counterpoise and some, some geometric corrections, right? But this is now a method that in, has no experimental input whatsoever, right? Everything is fitted to cover cluster results, right? And I would say that's a huge sort of conceptual advance. And the surprising thing, at least for me, is, is how well these things work. So here, here are binding energies. So these are electronic binding energies. They're not free energies. We'll get to that. Right? They're uh, fitted against cover cluster complete basis at limits, right? And so here you have the mean absolute deviation, 
for example, for the hard refact 3 c method. And mostly, right, on average, your errors are less than one kilocalorie per mole to within cover, I mean, compared to cover cluster, complete basis set limit. Right, and the amazing thing is if you throw in a, a density functional and larger basis sets, right, this error does not really change. Right? You, you, you're where you want to be accuracy-wise, right? but you now have methods that are incredibly fast. Right? The same here, PM6, not, it, it gives good mechanisms, but hydrogen bonding-wise is not very good. Right? Again, these simple dispersion and hydrogen bonding corrections. Right? They're just as good as, as ab initial. Okay, so the, for many things now, the accuracy of these new semi-empirical methods rival that of cover cluster, okay, but because they have been fitted to cover cluster, okay, but they do so much more consistently than before. Okay, and that means that we can do new things that we couldn't do before. So, for example, if you have a, a fast method like PM6, dispersion and hydrogen bonding, bonded correction PM6, that when you optimize this, you get the, the right structures. So these are host guest complexes, right? So the, the, the host, the guest is no longer leaving the host and things like that, right? They're actually sitting there exactly where they should be, but now with a method that's fast enough that you can calculate all the vibrational frequencies for this. And so if you can do that, that means you can get the, the free energies for this. And so again, this is work by Grimming. So uh, very large basis at DFT single point, right? And all the thermodynamics comes from a dispersion and hydrogen bond corrected PM6, right? So he can calculate binding free energies and compare it to experiment, right? And now the mean absolute deviation here is two kilocalories per mole. So it's not quite where we want to be yet, but, it, be where, but it's, it's, it's quite close. It's starting to be accurate enough compared to experiment Right, that you, you can say something meaningful about, about the binding process. Right? And if you can then translate this, this methodology into something that can handle protein ligand binding, then all of a sudden you're, you know, this kind of accuracy is useful for drug design. And it's fast enough for drug design. Okay, and so uh, a few of you might have, might have read uh, similar studies on host gas complexes with similar accuracies. But the difference, I would argue, is that this has no adjustable parameters. This is not, this is not after the linear regression to the experimental data. This is the, this is the raw data. All right? So this is an ab initio prediction of binding free energies, insolvent. So I think that's, that's an exciting advance. So I think we, we have to start taking these semi-empirical methods serious. And we have to start thinking about what do we need to do with these methods to improve them? And what can we, once they're improved enough, what, what can we do? It really, if something is a thousand times faster than what you're used to, you really have to start thinking differently about how you apply these things. Okay, so here are some examples that we're starting to, to look at a little. So for example, um, you, you can now you, well, for uh, the last 10 or 15 years, computers have been fast enough that you can optimize protein structures, small protein structures, with semi-empirical methods. And the problem has been that they, all, they always got worse. Okay? So you, you optimize it with the semi-empirical quantum mechanics, and the structures get worse, they unfold. Okay? Now they get better. Okay? So here's some comparisons of optimized structures compared to the experimental crystal structures. And you can see the RMSD is about half an angstrom, which is probably reflecting real, real changes in the hydrogen bonding geometry. Okay, you can also start thinking about accurate activation energies for enzymatic reactions, and as I showed in the previous slide, accurate binding free energies, free energies for protein ligand complexes. And you can also start thinking in terms of automation and high throughput screening. So one of the things we started looking at is chemical shift prediction for proteins and also screening enzyme mutants. And I don't have a lot of time, so I just want to uh, talk about the screening of enzyme mutants as an example of what you can do. Quick question. The yes. Quick yeah. They have been interpreted with molecular mechanics models. Are they using the same 
mean, so the X, the X, I mean, you're not comparing with the X-ray raw data. No. You're ex comparing with, with uh, Yeah. Yeah. But this, still, this is still, if you look at protein structure prediction, the X-ray structure is still the gold standard. So you can, you can do what you want, but if so you can't... You can't, you can't the, the, the underlying molecular mechanics no. model. But at least it doesn't get worse now. Okay? At least it doesn't unfold. So that means that if you now want to explore other structures, you have a reasonable expectation of a similar kind of accuracy, okay? which you don't have if you, if you start with one of these structures and the thing just unravels. Yeah. But of course, and this is actually one of the reasons to look at chemical shifts, right? If these are x-ray structures in solution with a fit to experimental data, not the raw data. Right, and so how you, what is actually an accurate protein structure and solution? That's something I think where you're going to need the NMR chemical shifts. So something that's measured, sensitive to the structure and measured in solution. And so that's one of the reasons we're looking at that. So it's, I mean, your point is very well taken. Whether a, a protein structure is good or not is an incredibly complex and, and a little bit ill-defined problem, actually. Um. One, we, one thing we have done is, is try to take computational enzyme mechanism prediction to the next level, right? So uh, a normal QMM calculation will typically look at the wild type, and it'll give some uh, proposal for the enzymatic mechanism. And then you have some barriers that may or may not agree with the experimental data. Okay, what we want to try to do now is to say, well, and that, you know, that's the time limit because it can take up to one or two years to, with QMMM and all the dynamics and so forth to, to work out the reaction mechanism with, with, with sort of standard avenue of quantum mechanics. So what if you can do this a thousand times faster? Well, one of the things you can do is start looking for enzyme mutants with lower barriers, right? So if you come from biotechnology, one of the, the, the real reason you want to figure out why the enzyme works the way it does or how it works is to design better mutants, to get some ideas. Okay? So what we propose is, is a, method, a method we've worked out where you actually go in and you just try the mutants brute force. Right? So what you have here is an enzyme active site, and this mess here is just a depiction of a single site that we picked in the active site. Uh, where we've mutated that residue to all the other 19 possibilities and then computed the barrier. Right? And so again, this is quick and dirty. This is a, a scan. Right? You have to do it quick and dirty if you want to do 1,000 barrier calculations. Right? But the point is you can actually do this now with, with uh, semi-empirical quantum mechanics. Okay, so now you, of course, this has a lot of stuff missing. You're not doing a careful job if you have to do it a thousand times, right? Because you have to do it faster than the experimental screen, right? So what you have to do is you have to use this the same way you use experimental high throughput screening, right? You generate ideas, possible mutations that you can then study further. And you can do that either experimentally or using more refined or more uh, sophisticated QMMM methods. Right? But if you talk to a company like Novozymes, which is not too far from Copenhagen, right? they, the idea of checking a barrier height within a year is, is pretty laughable, right? because they can make a mutant like this within a few weeks or a month. So why not do it experimentally uh, instead of computation? So you still have to be able to do this fast. OK. So, but I, I think at the bottom of all this, what's, what's been driving this Right, is actually these, these couple cluster data sets. That's really what, what's made all this possible. Uh, so this has actually been a huge practical advance. Uh, and most data sets out there, at least for that are the biochemically relevant, has been interaction. So hydrogen bonding strength or dispersion str strength or things like that for relatively small systems. Right? If we want to go on into spectroscopy or in somatics, right, we need similar data sets for barrier heights, right? But again, something that's biologically relevant. So we've started to put something like that together. Um, it, well, basically what we're starting to put together is 
the kind of starting points for making such a, a data set for barrier heights. Right? So we're going through the literature, finding uh, model systems for enzymatic reactionism, reaction mechanisms and collecting them in one site. Okay, so for example, this is something from Fami Hemo where he's looked at several different models of varying sizes, right? And he's done it at this level of theory. Okay, but if you want to parameterize a method or test a semi-empirical method, right, I would much rather do it against the cover cluster results. And so if you take the, the binding energy stuff as a reference, what you would need uh, are cover cluster uh, single points at these kinds of level of theory to, do, to extrapolate to the complete basis set level, right? And at a minimum, these kinds of geometries, okay? For these kinds of systems, okay? So we're putting together the, uh, a sort of a, a go-to source for getting the geometries, right? And the hope is that other people will come in with their correlated, the latest correlated methods and try to see if they can actually compute something like this, barrier heights in a meaningful period of time, okay? And the idea then is to take that data and validate or fit new semi-empirical methods, okay? Uh, so to replace the experimental data. Uh, we've also started to put a, a sort of a, a revised version of PM6 in games so that it's in a what I would call a proper quantum mechanical code, so we can play with it. And these methods, as I said now, are sufficiently fast that we can, for example, from our NMR chemical shift calculations, we're talking millions of calculations. Uh, these are DFT calculations on fault systems. So we can use quantum mechanics in kind of a, in a different way, in a more automated, high-throughput way. Right? And this means that quantum chemists have to learn some new things about how to automate things or how to generate a diverse set of, of structures that include millions of different kinds of chemicals. So we need to talk to our chem informatics people. And I really think that, that these kind of things should start to be an integral part of, of new modeling projects. Right? So instead of thinking in terms of tens of structures, right, why not start thinking in terms of hundreds of th or, or even thousands of structures? Right? With sort of the, the semi, these new rigorously parameterized semi-empirical methods as, as the starting point. Okay, so that's, that's all I have. Thanks very much for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions you have.